and thank you to the entire panel for the, the information to share a lot of great ideas here. And we'll have a, uh, we'll do a few questions here. I'm gonna just uh, share a couple of questions. Uh, Tom, I think maybe this one would start with you. Uh, Tom, you've had some experience working with uh, brokering of manure. Uh, could you just share a, a, a lesson or two that you've learned that you think helped make that brokering of manure uh, 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 function well or, or work within some of your communities? Um, <clears throat> one thing, when I had uh, been conferring with some other people who were, uh, as I would say, peddling manure nutrients, we kind of came up with the rule of thumb that the, the level of resistance was 50%. In other words, if you can get those same nutrients on the field for 50% um, of what, if they bought it as fertilizer, then we could overcome that resistance. They're willing to put up with the inconvenience if there's a good cost savings. A good friend of mine always says, follow the money. And when you're dealing with farmers, the bottom line is what's it going to cost me. So um, in some of the more difficult manures, I mean, poultry manure, it, it's pretty easy because it's pretty concentrated and, um, <clears throat> and valuable. But the, the other manures like hog manures and some of the lower value dairy um, and beef manures, what we found might work well is at least trading manure for the cost of application because the cost of application is a big expense to the, to the facility. But if the recipient will at least pay for the land application of that for the nutrients, then everybody comes out ahead there too. So the, you know, the dairy is making money um, because it's not spending money that it would have to otherwise. Great, thank you for those thoughts. All right, let's move on. Um, one of the questions uh, was about some of the supplements that we put in our feed that are more for therapeutic use. Uh, they mentioned copper. Uh, I, I imagine they're referring to antibiotics as well. Uh, are, do you have any concern about those becoming barriers to manure use uh, on uh, when we try transferring manure? And I'll look to any of the three panelists if you've got any thoughts to add to this. Well, I did, I guess I addressed it prematurely when that question came out. And what I said was that in theory, it, it could be a consideration. And when we have our anti-animal agriculture people come out in force, that's one thing they bring up. But I will say in reality, in the field, we have not seen any experience as far as uh, detrimental impacts on yields or even with the soil health tests that we've been doing a lot over the past years. And in fact, we find the opposite where manures have been used, we have much higher soil health readings. Um, but in comparison, we do know chemical fertilizers, especially those high in salts and others like anhydrous ammonia, you can document and see detriments to yield and soil health. So again, I think in theory, some of those things uh, might be a concern and perhaps warrants further research, but in the field, we just, we see the opposite effect. Amy, do you have any thoughts on the antibiotic side, the use? Yeah, I think um, the only thing I would add there is that any, um, you know, certain chemicals that are in the soil environment can um, affect the selective pressure that's, that causes organisms to, um, to evolve and, and develop resistance to antibiotics. And so we know that you know, heavy metals and other contaminants like that will, will impact the microbiology of the soil and, and perhaps promote development of antimicrobial resistance. Um, but I don't know that it's, um, I, I would say that manure is less of a culprit than probably municipal waste products that contain um, probably a larger variety of synthetic chemicals. Thank you, Amy. We're going to move on. Um, one of our uh, participants uh, 
make this made the statements that we need to stop thinking about manure as a waste and think about it as a resource. Uh, and just wondered what the speaker's response to that. You, you, I guess you've been sharing that through the whole presentations, but what's maybe your first reaction when you hear that from a, a neighbor or a client uh, that it's in terms of telling people that or sharing with people the idea that it's a resource over a waste? I'll jump in on this one. And I would just, when I saw that comment, I, I wholeheartedly um, agree with that. And um, like someone else shared, you know, we stopped talking about manure as a waste product out in California a long, long time ago. Um, but, you know, some of that runs deep um, within the, even the cropping sector. Um, and I think, you know, some of that has come from other, you know, products and their desire to market those products um, is to, you know, kind of poo-poo manure um, and so forth. But um, I think, um, not to use a pun, um, but I do think that, um, you know, as we're talking about it um, and talking about its attributes, it's really base critical um, that we talk about all the, you know, the positives um, of, of manure um, and its benefits as a soil amendment, as well as um, nutrients um, out there for all of these other crops um, so that we start to, to reinforce that, um, you know, within our neighboring communities. Yeah, I, I agree, Denise. I don't know that I'd add much other than, to me, it's, it's a resource unless you can't find a way to use it. And so I think that's why we're working so hard to help people find the way to use it and to get it distributed the way it needs to be and to use that manure that's available before we import inorganic fertilizers to a region. So, so um, yeah, but that, that has definitely been the direction we've been going for the last 20 years or so and talking about it, not talking about waste management, but talking manure management. I really yeah. know that you know, when you go into these soils and all I've added is, you know, synthetic NP and K for years, um, and then you go in there and add manure, um, they see all kinds of um, improvements, including production improvements are, you know, astronomical, um, you know, within, within those production systems. Um, so there's, you know, no doubt about it. Um, and I think, you know, we just need to continue to educate people um, and kind of clarify, you know, that when they're getting manure, they're getting the whole package. They aren't just getting N, P, and K, um, you know, like they are when out here they would just pull in the ammonia, you know, anhydrous tank and pump out liquid nitrogen on there. Um, you know, they're getting all of the miners um, and all of that element, and that's all feeding that, that soil health web. Anything you want to add to that, Tom, or you? No, well, the only thing, we've had a concerted effort in years past in educating the state legislature people who, when we come up with uh, manure regulations, we don't call it waste. <clears throat> and even, per, you know, within NRCS and some of the government agencies, they talk about waste management and that sort of thing. And we need to work that out of their vocabulary as well. Uh, I'm going to ask one of Denise uh, and others can chime in. Uh, we've you know, had discussions over many years about technologies that will produce a product that will be more uh, valuable to some of our neighbors. Uh, any signs or a, a technology you're looking at that you think is going to really stand out in the next few years uh, for, you know, providing a product that we'd like to see? Yeah someone, else asked that. yeah, someone else asked that, you know, within the questions. And, um, you know, right here now, we're trying to understand our, um, our manure streams. Um, so, you know, we have folks using vacuum technology for one or more days of the week. And we've got people using what's called a processor pit and so forth. So, um, you know, we're trying to get these, um, understand these systems so that, you know, we know what, um, advanced manure technologies might be applicable here. Um, I think everyone's watching the, the CEDRON um, system that they're trying out in Texas. Um, we've also seen, um, you know, issues or companies like 
figure eight um, and the Clara system, as well as the Trident system. So I think some of these technologies, um, you know, they're coming on board, but the problem is, is that they're, they're quite expensive. Um, and so one of the things that we're having some issues at here is just identifying, um, you know, somebody who's willing to, you know, put it, install it on the dairy so we can start testing it and, you know, and start looking at it. Um, but I think that's the direction that, you know, we're kind of headed out here is um, some of these systems that will it'll give us a drier product, obviously, um, and a product that can be pelletized or put into a prill form because that's what the market is clearly indicating to us that in the crops grown out here, that's what they want. They don't want to have to broadcast spread um, and, um, and the like. So they want to be able to, you know, put it right in the windrow or right in the tree line or whatever the issue is. Um, and, um, you know, so that's what we're trying to hit out here. Great. Well, thank you to our panel today. We really value the, the ideas that you had to share uh, about this topic and the, the, how we can begin thinking about manure being transferred to neighboring crop farms or, or farms of a wide variety. Uh, the lessons you've learned in your own part of the country, I think, have been valuable to all of us. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.